Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever it is, wherever you are, welcome to the Good Values Podcast. In this episode, I'm going to be talking to someone who I met three years ago, and it was kind of a chance meeting where we were both in a really large lobby area that was filled with people, and I'd sat down at a table with um, a lady who I didn't know, and I started talking to her, and then out of nowhere, this gentleman comes and sits down, and we all get talking, and it turns out that he's not only on the same course as I am, he's in the same year as I am, and he's also from the same town as I am. And we did this in a separate town from where we both live. So it was quite a coincidence when we met, and it was uh, pretty humorous, you know, at the time. Since then, I've learned a lot about his ability, his skills, and his um, his kind of careful consideration about himself and the world around him. And I really appreciated being able to sit down and talk to him because we are good friends and I really love talking to him um, as often as I can. So, okay, this episode is with John Hughes and here it is. If you don't mind, would you be able to introduce yourself to the audience, please? Yeah. Okay, Simon, yes. Uh, I'm John Hughes, uh, and I'm basically a maker of things. Uh, don't call myself an artist or anything else. Uh, and I've made things since I was a child, a young child. And that's what I still do, whether it's a painting or a, a house or a car on a motorcycle I make things that's what I do and you've done that all your life is that correct or is it from a certain age that you started focusing more on being a maker of things no I've done it all my life since I was a baby yeah excellent and is there anything more specific is you are you more inclined to drawing or painting or sculpting is there any specific discipline that you're more drawn to than others yes drawing really because um it's difficult to make something without having a, a plan or a drawing. Uh, my father used to, when I was small, I'd say, can you make me one of these? He'd say, make me a drawing. So you've got to have a drawing to work to. So that's, that's how that came about. But I've drawn since I was, well, two year old or even younger. Really? Yeah. Wow. Uh, my relatives, my auntie, my grandparents, they used to keep all the old Christmas cards for me to draw on the back, uh, which was plain, because you couldn't get in. I was born in 1945, which was at the end of the Second World War, and you couldn't get sketchbooks or could hardly get pencils, but... Uh, um, you had to make the best of what you had, and that's what what it was. And I enjoyed it. Mm. And also did my family. Um, people used to say to my auntie, you know, uh, is he any trouble? No, she said, no. Give him a, a pencil and a piece of paper, and you don't hear anything from him for hours <laughs> and hours. Uh, Excellent. So it pleased everybody including myself I would yeah. I would invent things for myself um, as I say a maker of things you could all also call it an inventor of things what I didn't have or what I couldn't get I made I invented people didn't have any money you know and kids were poor and you know there wasn't a lot of socializing uh, we lived in communities, uh, which you don't see these days. Everybody in the community or the village which you lived in was your auntie or your uncle. You were all related. Uh, not genetically, but you were definitely related. We helped each other out. And uh, that's how it was. And that's how I grew up. And... Uh, 
and for play friends, I, I, I didn't have many. My auntie tried to find me some where they lived. Uh, and there weren't that many. But uh, I would invent my own. I would make my own friends. I would draw them, I'd cut them out, I'd colour them, I'd dress them. I'd sew. I used an old sewing machine and I'd make the clothes and they were real people to me and that still goes for today as you know Simon. I was going to ask when it comes to making things is there things which you're more inclined to make is it are you more drawn to portraiture or landscape or imagine things or or is it a bit of everything I mean what's what's really captured your interest creatively? Well, as I said, it, it, during the time I was born, there was no toy shops at all uh, or anything like that. Uh, the best you could get for a child was some uh, paper and crayons. Um, mm. Well, I, I did my share of that. But um, what, I, what I need, mm. if I wanted a... If I said, I wish I had a model aeroplane, I'd make one. Wow. If I wish I had a little joinery set or a hammer, I'd make one. Yeah. And that's what I did and that's what I still do. So you must have that's the latest I iPhone, I can imagine. Sorry? You must have the latest iPhone if you fancy one. I'll make one. I will make the iPhone, <laughs> yeah. whatever the model uh, is. I wish I could, but uh, no, uh, that technology has, has passed me by. Yeah. Uh, I don't like this technology, Simon. No. I think it's just taken away from what we have mm. as human beings and our relationship together. We are tribal animals. Yeah. And that's, there's a great value in that. That's where the protection is. Yeah. And the care and the nurture, which you need to live. Mm. Everybody does. Every human being does. Every animal does. Yeah. Come to that. You need that support, which is missing today, as you so well know, Simon. Yeah, I do. Yeah. You've seen it for yourself. So that's what it's all about. My experience of seeing your work... I mean, if you'll forgive me, this could be an inaccurate, but I was hoping to discuss things like, I see your portraiture and how strong you do the likeness of people when you, when you paint and draw people, and also surrealism, which I don't know if you're you know, aware that that's what people see in your work, but I see surrealist influences in your work and, and just uh, creatively things that are conjured from the imagination and the emotions coming out in your artwork, whether it's a sculpture or a painting or a drawing. I've noticed those things more than landscapes, but I think that's only because of maybe the time that I've known you. I haven't seen you do landscapes, whereas I'm imagining you've experienced that just as much as any other type of work. Mm. Is that right? Well, if you, if you had it done, Simon, you would have seen the same thing in my landscapes. Mm. They're exactly the same. Surreal, uh, larger than life, let's say. Yeah. Because everything is to me. Mm. Uh, it always was. Well, when I was small, I was tiny and everything was larger than life, literally. But, uh, and I knew it and I valued that. And I miss it badly. Mm. But, and that's why I, I try, I, I try to replicate it in either in a drawing or a painting. Mm. Again, what I haven't got, I will make, or I will try to make. I'll give it my best shot, if you like. Mm. I need those things around me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And what you were mentioning earlier, I was going to say about us being tribal and social species so that we do need these uh, connections with each other in this network of friends and, and acquaintances to make sure that we're all 
bonding and communicating strongly is something which I spoke um, with Petra about, and you know Petra, and her and I discussed these things. Coincidentally, she mentioned the same distaste for technology and the same value towards community. Yeah. So it is a value from an older time, which I think is, I think it's being, um, I could be wrong, but I think that the younger generation is starting to rekindle an interest in community that way, which my generation and a little bit younger lost, you know, and maybe my parents' generation lost a little bit due to television and the internet and this new technology just marching forward. Yeah. I speculated with Petra and I'm going to ask you the same thing. I wonder if it's a case that it's how you use the technology and we've had an unhealthy relationship with the television, with the internet, with our phones. And if we used it more wisely and effectively, like you and I do, where we use it to speak and share information and ideas, that it would be a much more beneficial and creative platform than what it is at the moment. What do you think? Absolutely, yes. And uh, I totally agree. I have seen... Uh, the signs in youngsters. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yes, there are some, there are signs. I've seen them, mm. uh, which I'm glad to see. Me too. I'm really glad to see. Yeah, makes you more optimistic, doesn't it? Because it seems quite dire sometimes, the loss of culture and connection between people. But I still see a glimpse of hope. For the future. Yes, yeah. yeah. For a long time, I couldn't see any. No. At all. It was going in the wrong direction. Mm. And uh, uh, I've I've taught children, you know, drawing, singing, music, whatever you like, over the years, and I've seen the changes in the children. Mm. Uh, they've all taken to to what I've taught them. Mm. They've all valued it, and it they've carried on on through the rest of their lives. Brilliant. It's interesting, yeah. isn't it, Simon? Yeah. It's, it's it's something to push you forward or drag you forward, even in the worst times. Yeah. That's interest, isn't it? Absolutely. That's the value in it. Mm. Not selling it for millions of pounds. It's being able to see the benefits in others. Yeah. That fascinates me. Mm. With me saying that this is called the Good Values Podcast... What is it that you value in art that you see? What do I value in art? So say if you visit a gallery or a museum and yeah. you view art, what do you value? What do you look at and think, this, I think, is what I value in, in art of others? The skill, Simon. Mm. The talent. I don't know whether it's skill or talent. I can't. You know, I can't differentiate between the two, but it's the skill. Mm. It's the talent. It's being able to do it. I think it's an innate quality myself mm. uh, that some have. Although <laughs> there's other genres of art whereby you don't need any skill no, or talent. Uh, abstract art, for instance. Okay, mm. you need a, a, a bit of a grounding, but you could get by uh, making abstract or patterns or whatever, but the real, uh, the real art, as I call it, like uh, Leonardo da Vinci um, and all the the old ancient ones, you know, the masters. Uh, yes, and uh, even well, I'm very influenced by the impressionist and post-impressionist periods. Mm. That's the period for me. Yeah. Uh, whereby it turned more to effect rather than a photograph. Yeah. You could feel yourself there mm. uh, in, in the landscape or the light, you know. In my, you know, and I wrote about myself and... and you know, like an introduction. I said, uh, I paint with vigor, with intention, with passion, if you like. And 
I paint in the electrifying colours that excite me or excite yes. my brain, if you like. Yeah. Uh, and that's what makes them surreal, Simon. Mm. Is that love for those colours? Yeah. Uh, there's something magical about them. I have noticed all, that with your work. Is yeah. that it's like a heightened reality, like a, a heavily saturated brightness yeah. and intensity yeah. of colour. Yeah, it's so exciting to me. I can't mm. really control it. And that's why it goes to the surreal, you see. But there's nothing wrong with that. I no. don't see it. It does. I don't think it fails because of it. No. Uh, I think it benefits because of it. I mean, I don't like anything I do. It's I do. I paint. Uh, I draw. It's none of it is any good to me. It's not good enough. Mm. <laughs> um, and I'll paint something. I painted Rutland Castle. Mm. I've done it years ago, but uh, yeah. I tried it recently, and uh, no, I didn't like it, so I put them all away. Mm. Uh, and I was looking at them a couple of weeks ago and seen them from oh, must be two years. I thought, crikey, that's good. Yeah, but it was the colours that made it good. Mm. The the water and the. Uh, and the building, the brick, you know. Mm. I mean, they do excite me. They are electrifying colours. Yeah. Well, they are, they're photons, aren't they? But, yeah. uh, yes, I like it, Simon, I colour. Absolutely. Well, I do credit you with teaching me more about how to make abstract art than any tutor in any schooling that I've received. And that was that one conversation that we had on the phone where we discussed, it was when we would, we'd watched the film The Gleaners and I, and we were discussing gleaning and old-fashioned sensibilities. Yeah. Yeah. And we both connected with that documentary quite well. Yeah. And it was a great conversation. But in that conversation, you discussed with me how to actually probe your thoughts and feelings in order to bring out something abstract, which is true and speaks of truth, as opposed to doing a practice which just makes a, a messy image and yeah. then trying to hope for something yeah. symbolic in that yeah. mess to actually start with something of substance and that really connected with me I haven't practiced it yet but I've always retained it as something which I'm hoping to tap into and yeah. I was going to ask with modern art is there anything which you see where you think this adds value to the culture of fine art Oh, yes, yeah. I don't uh, dislike abstract art. No. I have nothing against it. I use it myself. Hmm. But uh, the difficulty with it is, is you still need skill and talent. Yes. You need that hand-eye coordination. Hmm. Uh, it's that wrist movement. It's that hand movement hmm. that makes... Uh, somebody said to me, good marks, John. It didn't mean I got a lot of marks. It meant <laughs> I was making good marks. Well, yeah. I've done that since a child. Mm. I know what nice marks look like. Yeah. And that's all there is to it. Just knowing what they look like. Mm. And then you, once you know what they look like, you can use them in anything. Yeah. Anywhere, abstract, uh, portrait, formal, mm. uh, whatever you like, classical, they're all the same. It's that hand-eye coordination. I, mine works automatically, it always has done. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know why that is, but uh, uh, I don't know whether you can learn it. I don't know, Simon, it's, it's, it's in neurological thing that was it's something I was going to ask you next is if you think any of this can be taught yes you can teach it to an extent yeah to an extent uh, you can teach people to paint to draw mm. uh, which I do um, and they do well Um do you think you can teach people to see? Because that's one of the things which 
Bernard yeah. Wilhelm's taught. Yeah. yeah, to see That's things what I truly. Do. I teach yeah. them to see. Yes, yes, it just comes, flows through here into these, through the brush, through the paints, mm. and onto the paper or canvas. Uh, I don't particularly like painting on canvas mm. because of my growing up as a child. I, I used the old Christmas cards, they're smooth. Mm. Yeah. And I've always liked smooth things. I didn't like mm. rough textures. I never liked rough cloth or textiles, you know. Yeah. Uh, because when I was little, my mother made me an overcoat mm. out of an old grey blanket, which were all itchy, and yeah. <laughs> I've got sensitive skin, so I don't like them, and I like things smooth. Yeah. And I'm just thinking about it now, because I've been painting on canvas mm. while we've been on this course, you know, so I'm in there. Mm. I don't, I've painted on canvas, for years but I don't like it it's not no. me really I'd yeah. rather paint on board yeah. uh, or cardboard mm. uh, and I'm going back to that I mean I, I, I thought I was being unusual by painting on cardboard and board and things mm. no I'm not uh, there's many well Edvard Monk uh, painted mm. on cardboard and many others did yeah uh, so I wasn't that, but I always thought I wasn't good enough, Simon. Mm. So I suppose I've always striven to prove otherwise. I never proved it to myself. I couldn't, I would never be able to do that. Uh, so I, I find now. But um, sometimes it, it surprises me what mm. I've done when I look back. Uh, I painted nice. that one of Ed using the scream of Edward Monk, yeah, and uh, one of the little my little friends in it, yeah. And I just finished painting. I sat back to have a drink and see, and I looked at it, and it it just nearly knocked me off the chair. Really, I thought, crikey, where yeah. did that come from? Yeah, because I'm so engrossed and in getting the paints on and the lines mm. right. Yeah. That I don't see anything until mm. I after. So it's strange. I also think that it's there's a good value in being your own biggest critic, which you very much are, much like I am my own, where I will try to find fault in my own work and not be able to appreciate it until there's distance between you and the piece of work, just like you in years when you'd not seen your own work and then you all of a sudden appreciate it more. I think there's a good value in having that critical eye. And is that something you can consciously do, or is it something which you can't help? And because I'm trying to bestow that upon others, to teach yeah. other people to criticise their own work fairly harshly in order to no, improve. It's, I'm stuck with it, Simon. It's a neurological mm. thing. Mm. Yeah. It's, it, is a new, it is in your wiring mm. of your brain, the connections that are made. Uh, it's all in that, Simon. Yeah. And uh, a lot of it is influenced by genetics, which mine is. It gives you ability to do things, and it's up to you to decide how you want to use it. Uh, same for me. I, I, yeah, I paint. That's only part of it but I paint and I draw for my own satisfaction. Mm. Uh, I like to think, I see each painting or drawing as a challenge. And if I think I've met the challenge, that's good enough for me. Mm. And that's my reason for doing it. Yeah. Sometimes I don't meet the challenge and, you know, but I'll try again and, I try mm. and again till I do. But I see it as, you know, life is a challenge, as we know. Yeah. Uh, and some, and we meet it in different ways. Mm. Uh, very strange, but everything's strange, Simon. <laughs> we haven't got the answers to everything, sadly. No, no. Oh, before I forget, I didn't ask you. When it comes to painting, what's your preferred medium? Uh, yes, it's a it's a strange one, this Simon. Mm. <laughs> uh, difficult to explain for me, um, but. My favourite 
medium is poster paints. Really? Uh, but you could call them, if you wanted to be posh, you could call them gouache. Yeah. But uh, no, they're poster paints yeah. to me. Yeah. They are my favourite. And I, I think I'll be going back to them shortly. Mm. Uh, they're not as durable. Uh, but I've I've got paintings I did 40, 40 years ago mm. that's still good. I haven't kept many of my paintings. I don't keep them. Mm. Uh, I sold them as I as I did. People asked me for them, so I sold them. But uh, um, no, I, uh, I kept some of these. It was when I was ill, first ill, mm. uh, seriously ill, um, mental health. And uh, during that time, I painted. And I painted quite a number of paintings, uh, made them. And uh, I kept those for some reason. Yeah. Never kept anything else. Strange that. Ah, that does surprise me. I oh. thought it was uh, I thought it was oils, you see, so I was wrong. I'm glad I asked. No, no. <laughs> yeah. No. I have painted in them, but... Uh, no, uh, that's my favourite. You'd have to see what I did in poster paints to understand really mm. what what I mean by it. Paint is like drawing to me. Yeah, uh, it's just thicker. <laughs> it makes a thicker line. Mm. If I want a thin line, I, I like to use something like a pencil mm. or, or perhaps a pen now and again, uh, but. For the th really thick lines, like you know, quarter of an inch or something, it needs to be a brush to me. Yeah. It, you know, anything else isn't quick enough. No, it's hard to find a new. I need, pattern. I need, to, I need to get the image down. Well, because it, it, it's, it's moving in my brain. Mm. The image appears, but it's, it's not stationary. It's not fixed like a photograph. Yeah. It'll move and it'll disappear when it wants to. That's interesting. So I have to be reasonably quick. Yeah. I only need a slight distraction and it's gone. Mm. So, it's, but, and, and I can do that with poster paints because they dry exceptionally quickly. Right. I've not used them, you know. I need to try that. To try them. Yeah. They're similar they're to like a chalk, like a chalky finish. Yeah, I like that. A matte finish. Mm, I don't like the gloss finish. Mm. You know, you get that reflection, that shine. Yeah. Uh, and she no I don't like it no. it takes away from the image to me is there a colour that you'll always incorporate into a piece is there something where you think I always need a touch of red or I always need this is my you know preferred palette or something no I just use the three primary colours yeah that's all I use mm. I don't use any of your, yeah, I do, obviously, you know, when I, when I feel like it. Yeah. But mainly, I only have three colours, and that's the primary. I can mix any colour from those. Yeah, I do the same. I do appreciate that technique. Yeah. yeah. Um, obviously, if, if I want something special, I'll, I'll buy, you know, a sap green or something, yeah. you know, a yellow ochre or something. Yeah. But I normally mix my own from the three primaries mm. and black and white, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, so to the two questions which I always ask every guest, and this is because it's going to become a theme. It's things which my art mentor asked me every day that I would see her, and I know that every day it can be a relevant question. So I like to ask every artist that I speak to. I know you don't call yourself an artist, but as a creative person and a creator, I think it's relevant. The first is, what's the most beautiful thing you've seen today? The sun, the really? sky. That's amazing. Is this the sunrise or was it... When you woke up, no, through the window. No, the blue sky and the bright sun. Mm. I mean, it, to me, it's that, that's what illuminates the colours and everything. Mm. And, uh, you know, I've been restricted this morning, uh, but I managed to get out and I need to get out and see that blue sky. You know, skies amaze me. Yeah. Uh, there was a sunset last night, like 
you wouldn't believe so i filmed it last night i did i filmed did it you? it was phenomenal yeah yeah uh i i would have had to driven away you know to get a good view but yeah. uh, i i didn't have a chance to to take a snap of it but i mean i've taken countless photographs of sunsets mm. and sunrises and clouds on yeah and you know when you try to draw paint a cloud on mm. a sky you'd never seem to be able to get it right <laughs> no. but nature does it perfectly yeah every time <laughs> yeah doesn't matter what shape color or whatever no. it's perfect in every detail yeah just make a funny mistake does it no, but there are curious slip. things, you know, because I saw last week, and I photographed this, so I can send this to you. I saw a backwards ass in the sky, like a big swooping backwards ass. And I've never seen yeah. that in the sky before. To see like a, a real stylized kind of swoopy ass. Oh, yeah. And it was yeah. very strange. It, was, it wasn't It was a plane. It was just a wisp of a cloud, but it was yeah, yeah. backwards ass. I noticed. Well, that's good you see that. I noticed things like that. Mm. That's... Uh, it's it's that noticing that's mm. the important part. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people don't see these little magical marks and and spaces. Yeah. They just pass it by. Oh yeah, you, you know, it's a house on the side. No, I see the shape of the roof. I see the door. You know, yeah. what a fantastic old fashioned door. Yeah. And what gets me is they used. To, in the old days, as, as I, I grew up in, yeah. uh, there was only two colours. That was inside and out for, for woodwork and whatever, windows and interior. That was like a, a cream yeah. and a, uh, a green. Really? <laughs> yeah. And yeah. inside, they'd have a, like a dado yeah. line. And it, the bottom would be green and the top would be cream. Really, yeah. Uh, this is all functional. Mm. But uh, I saw one yesterday. can't remember when I saw it now. I looked and I saw this old doorway in this old stone house. Yeah. And it was that green. <laughs> wow. And there was a chap up in the village where Helwyn lived. Yeah. He lived in his mother's house. Mm. He's passed away now and... Somebody's probably bought the house, and but it was in its original paint, which wow. was cream and green. Um, that's of the only two colours that were available in those days. Really, I never knew that. It's interesting. Oh yeah, I'll, I'll have to show you sometimes. Yeah, and it's uh, it, it, and I like the colour. Yeah, I think they go to with, together extremely well. Yeah, they sound complementary. Oh, they do, and uh, and when it's weathered, that's uh, you know, it's got that chalky appearance. Mm. The gloss has gone, you know, yeah, and which makes it look even better. That Absolutely. green, Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Oh, I love it. Go Was ahead. another one, Simon? There's a double barrel question for the last question. Right, and it's what do you like and what don't you like about your own work? Well, I don't like. The mistakes I make. Mm. Uh, no, no, no. I don't really like anything I do, as I tried to explain to you before. Mm. And yet, I can sort of appreciate that it's reasonable, a, mm. a, a decent effort. Yeah. Uh, it probably comes from my childhood. Mm. But... Uh, there's... I can't say I like or dislike. Well, I, I'm never happy with anything I do. Yeah. Uh, I make, whether it's a painting or anything else, it's never perfect enough for me. Mm. It, it's not as good as nature, Simon. <laughs> no, we can't do that. Can and we? that's what I'm trying to replicate. Yeah. So it's it, a bit disappointing for me. It's a challenging question. I like to ask people and... There's a South Korean artist who's very famous these days. He's an illustrator called uh, Kim Jong-yi. And when I ask him that question, he'll only a answer the what don't you like. He'll never answer what he does like. He says he doesn't like anything about it. He'll only answer what he doesn't like. 
and he's known as a, as a genius in art and he only has criticism for his own artwork. So it shows that good artists have criticism for their own work and less praise for their own work. I think yeah. but that may not be consistent, but that's my experience. Is that no, that's interesting. That healthy because of, that's certainly me, mm. uh, and I totally agree. I mean, it's that challenge that drives you on, Simon. Yeah, you know, I've I've been, I was drawing when I was two, mm. painting when I was six, to wider claim, you know, the teachers, you know, where. Uh, you know, I was painting religious scenes, mm. uh, the stories I was taught in Sunday school, and they couldn't believe what they were seeing. Um, and I was painting when I, when I was six. And I'm still painting and drawing now as well. As, well, everything I make, mm. even in engineering, my career was engineering, mm. which is, invent is making things. Uh, I didn't like taking things down you know demolishing them yeah oh that hurt me badly I like creating but it's it's that challenge you know if you say yeah I like that it's good mm. where's the challenge for the next one yeah I don't think you, it's there I wouldn't uh, I can't I can't see it being there and that challenge is what's kept me going yeah I do wonder yeah, if you're satisfied if you stagnate. That's what I wonder is that, you know, if you say that I've reached my peak, I think that my work's fantastic. If you'll just stagnate in that level and you'll never push to increase and improve and, and try to uh, try to make sure that you're oh, challenging um, yourself, as you say. Well, uh, a few years ago, uh, what was it? Uh, 1980s and 90s I was employed as a graphic designer and illustrator mm. and I was at the top of my field then I, I made the businesses a lot of money so mm. I mean a lot of money mm. a lot of business people I made them a lot of money and uh, and I'm still striving to get back to that level. Mm. I don't know whether I, I will be able to. I don't think I can reach it. People could, well, my assistant, a young lady, she said, can you draw me something? I said, what do you want? She said, draw me a, a what was it? A swan or something. So mm. I just, like that. Yeah. Crikey, how did you do that, John? I said, don't know, really. <laughs> I can't do it now. As I say, I gave up on drawing. Mm. Uh, and for, and I only started again because these two little American girls a kept asking me to draw yeah. them something to colour in. And that's what brought me back to drawing and mm. painting. Uh, but I, it's like my son. He was brilliant and then he gave up golf. Mm. Now he's gone back to it and he's... He's trying particularly hard, just like me, to get back to where he was in his prime, if you like. Yeah. I don't know whether this prime happens at a certain age or what. I don't know. But you need to get back to it. You mm. know what you were, what you could do. Mm. Why can't I do that now? It's a mystery. Though, You'll see it? it in some of them, when I show you some of them old poster paintings. Yeah. That You'll, why can't I get back to that now mm. and I don't know I'm still striving to yeah. and I think that's what pushes you forward Yeah. I mean to be honestly from what happened, what's happened to me in the recent years I, you couldn't blame me for not wanting to paint anymore but no it's not going to it's not going to take that away from me no not if i have anything it's, to do with it i'll try to no uh, <laughs> it's, it's, the drive is still there so i'm okay yeah. i've got a bit of a cup i'm not doing much at the moment so i'm doing something else mm. but uh it's still there i will do it i know i will yeah it's just finding that that kind of magic point again that kind I, yeah, of goldilocks zone it, almost yeah it's like the switch is 
going over, you mm. know, like just wait. I got to wait now for the switch to go. I still do a bit of drawing. I've got mm. a few things I need to do for other people that's mm. asked me. And I thought, well, no. And then it's happened to me. I thought, mm. you know, I don't like this anymore. Mm. No, I can't. I can't accept that. No. We, can, we can't accept these things destroying art, Simon. Mm. We can't allow it to happen. No. Not to ourselves, anyway. No, it's up to us to try and rekindle that motivation again, I suppose, isn't it? And well, find... we will do it. Yeah. Yeah, using community, I think, helps. That's why I like these yeah. connections that we can make. And yeah. I want to thank you for being on the podcast. It's uh, it's an absolute pleasure and an honour to have you on to discuss a bit of your background. We've kept it very brief. And as I've said yeah. to you before, we're going to do a, an artist profile, which will be a bit more extensive and show a lot more of your background mm -hmm. and, and allow you to talk at greater length than what we've done in this conversation. But for this episode, I think it's been a real pleasure. I really appreciated it. Thank you, Simon. Oh, thank yeah. you very much. You, you've been wonderful yourself. No, I appreciate that, John. Yeah, you're easy to talk to, Simon. No, I really. And you're that. you're a wonderful person. You oh, take care of kind. yourself, Simon. You too. Thank you very much, John. All right. Okay. Send. Bye, Simon. Bye. Okay, so that's the episode done. Now, I really enjoyed that. I hope that you did too. I thought it was really nice to show his paintings and his drawings and the things that he'd built as well. I thought it was really interesting. I loved how he um, weighed up what he valued about um, society and life and talent. And uh, he's very thoughtful with things like that. He often discusses those things with me. And um, I just thought it was really nice to be able to show the different types of works that he's made over the years and the different approaches that he has to work. It was quite different seeing his landscape work and his portrait work from his more surreal work that you see where it's um, his landscapes and portraits had heightened aspects, but his other works were very dreamlike and and sort of um, just conjured, you know, like just imagined from nowhere or from somewhere deep inside of himself, his subconscious potentially. But I thought all that was pretty fascinating and I really appreciated him um, delving into those areas and being honest with us because he's he's a very honest person. So I hope you enjoyed the episode. If you did, then please leave a like, comment down below, subscribe to the channel, ring that notification bell, and I'll see you in the next episode.